1954, the United States Air Force issued the Lockheed Skunk Works a contract to build a high-altitude reconnaissance airplane. The original concept was simply an F-104 with the landing gear removed and a high aspect ratio wing attached. The airplane was to be launched from a dolly, used for a single mission, landed on a fuselage skid, and then discarded. Kelly Johnson went to work with less than 50 engineers, and working 100-hour weeks, the first flight occurred exactly eight months from contract go-ahead. This is the U-2 vertical stabilizer being attached to the first airplane in 1955. The dolly, similar to that plan for launchers, is used for ground testing and moving the airplane around. It was delivered to the test site by a Douglas C-124. This shows the empennage and the wings being disembarked on the lake bed. The components were transported to a specially built hangar, reassembled for the ground testing phase and the initial test flights. This is first rollout of the U-2. The airplane was quite a bit different than the originally conceived design, but retains some of the features of the F-104. It has a conventional tail and bicycle landing gear. Outrigger wheels, referred to as pogos, were added to the wings about mid-span to keep the wings level on the ground. Here is the original engine test run. Shelly Johnson walks up to check it out and see why it is smoking. First flight occurred on August 1955. This is the first test flight of the U-2A piloted by Tony Levere. Some of the wing bending tests conducted during the early test flight show the order of magnitude of wing bending. Notice the airplane has speed brakes located similar to an F-104. Here is a good shot of the aircraft on initial press flight with extended landing gear and deflected flaps. Four U-2s in formation over the test site. These are U-2As, the first U-2s built. This is an updated version of the U-2, designated a U-2C with a J-75 engine replacing the J-57 and providing for approximately 700 pounds of payload. Pogos drop off on takeoff as the airplane accelerates and the wings flex upward. These landings are flight test demonstrations of high sink rate landings to evaluate the dynamics and structural integrity of the landing gear. The airplane was demonstrated to 7.5 feet per second sink rate, and while not considered high for tactical airplanes, for an airplane such as a U-2, it is considered to be quite significant. This is the 7.5 feet per second sink rate landing. Here we see some crosswind landing tests performed at Palmdale. The airplane is operating in a 32 knot gust condition with 19 knots at 90 degree right crosswind components. If you watch closely, you can see in some of the pictures where the vertical stabilizer is actually to the right of the center line of the airplane as it crabs down the runway. The U-2 crosswind landing technique is very unconventional in that the pilot has to keep the downwind wing down and the upwind wing up. Here you see the vertical stabilizer to the right and the main gear to the left of center line of the airplane during its approach. By keeping the downwind wing down and putting the skid on the runway, the pilot is able to generate a very significant yawing moment 
with a long wing and keep the airplane from weather cocking into the wind, thus keeping it going straight down the runway. Notice here that the downwind wing is down on the runway and the pilot is able to better maintain directional control. Takeoffs are with the flaps up. To extend the airplane's endurance, an in-flight refueling system was incorporated and flight testing performed from the Lockheed Van Nuys facility. In-flight refueling was performed utilizing a KC-97 aircraft with the boom and receptacle type of in-flight refueling system. The receptacle is aft of the pilot and the boom operator merely flies the boom down into the receptacle after the pilot flies the airplane into a close refueling position. The aircraft has the capability of remaining aloft over eight hours without being refueled. The silver area in the center of the upper fuselage is the receptacle. Notice that the flaps have been raised into what has been referred to as the gust position. This unloads the wing at high indicated airspeeds to compensate for gust loads and at excessive Mach numbers to compensate for the change in aerodynamic center of pressure and unload the tail. This unique feature was utilized in 1955 in the U-2 and has been utilized extensively in the development of larger transport aircraft to unload the wing during gust conditions and severe turbulence. Lake Tahoe may be seen in the upper right hand corner. The airplane incorporated a fuel dump system in order to lighten the landing gross weights for some very specialized missions using very small landing sites. Francis Gary Powers, who after he returned to the United States from detention in Russia, became a Lockheed test pilot. He remained a Lockheed test pilot until May of 1970, at which time he went to work for a local news station flying fixed-wing aircraft reporting on freeway conditions as well as other items of interest. He later transitioned to helicopter flying, performing similar missions, and was later killed in a helicopter accident. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration is assigned two U-2 aircraft on loan from the United States Air Force for Earth Resources Research, Disaster Surveillance, and Aerial Mapping. The early U-2s utilized a partial pressure suit for the crew member while operating at high altitudes. The partial pressure suit was developed a good many years before the U-2 actually started flying but was a required flight item for all flights above 50,000 feet, and the U-2 was breaking the English Canberra altitude record of 68,000 feet on a daily basis in 1955. Notice how the Pogos drop off the NASA airplane during takeoff. These shots are up over the High Sierras in the vicinity of Mount Whitney. Kelly Johnson personally inspects the manufacturing of all Skunk Works airplanes, including the U-2 trainer. Bill Park with the striped tie getting into the cockpit to check out the flight control system. Kelly Johnson inspecting the tailpipe installation. This is the first flight of the U-2 trainer at Palmdale. 
The trainer was developed from a U-2C airplane, which had experienced an extremely hard landing. The aircraft was refurbished and modified into a two-place airplane. It is interesting to note that the first trainer was available 17 years after the first U-2 flight. In 1966, the United States Air Force purchased a highly modified U-2, which was designated the U-2R. Here you will notice the pilot in a full pressure suit manning the U-2R. The U-2R is a much larger airplane than the U-2As and Cs. It has a considerably increased wingspan, a larger fuselage, a Kelly Johnson tail, improved handling characteristics both at high altitude and in the landing and takeoff phases. This is a U-2R climbing out of Beale Air Force Base in Northern California. The U-2R is a much larger airplane with considerably increased payload capability. This allows many different mission systems to be carried on every flight. Comparing this landing of the U-2R with some of the earlier landings of the U-2, you will notice that it has much better characteristics at low altitude in the landing approach. It has an improved wing, more positive control system, spoilers for improved lateral control. On landing rollout, pilots tend to keep the wing down in the direction of the anticipated turnoff of the runway in order to let fuel accumulate in the low wing to compensate for the rolling tendencies during turnoff. The ground crew accompanies the airplane in a pickup on landing rollout and turnoff. When the airplane comes to a complete stop, the crew inserts the pogos to permit ease of ground handling. These are the carrier suitability trials of the U-2R aboard CVA-66 in the Pacific. The airplane has the capability of an arrested landing utilizing a tail hook and does not require catapult for launching. Here you see the U-2 demonstrating a wave off. The wave off characteristics of the airplane are extremely good due to the excellent response characteristics of the J-75 engine. This is a trap utilizing the arresting hook, disengagement from the resting gear, and another deck launch. The airplane requires very little takeoff roll with a 25 knot wind across the deck. Another trap. Takeoff in the Atlantic, fly across the United States, and land in the Pacific. This is the tail off of the U-2 store, which shows a picture of the U-2A on one of its early test flights for the United States Air Force. One of the significant things about the U-2 program was that at the completion of the program, Kelly Johnson was able to return to the customer several million dollars, resulting from a cost underrun due to the efficient methods employed by the skunk group. <laughs>